guten, guten Tag, meine Damen und Herren. Vielen Dank, dass Sie so zahlreich gekommen sind zu unserem Kunstdiskurs. Ich freue mich riesig, hier zu sein und bei Gion Rubins Ausstellungseröffnung Looking Away hier in der Galerie Karsten Grebe in Köln und insbesondere mit diesem Kunstdiskurs zwischen dem Künstler und Dr. Nadine Miriam hier im Rahmen der EC Open. Dr. Nadine Miriam ist Psychotherapeutin und Dozentin an der Universität zu Köln und bald auch in Paris an der Universität paris Nanterre. Sie schreibt gerade an zwei Büchern, eines davon mit der Philosophin Lucia Seenbruck über das Cyberbombing-Dispositiv und das andere über die Phänomenologie des Leids und Resilienz. Ich möchte mich ganz kurz bei Ihnen vorstellen. Ich bin Anita Vessier, Kuratorin, Artbesatzerin und Gründerin der Kunstplattform Anita's Eye. Ich kenne Gideons Rubins künstlerische Schaffen schon seit seinem Studienjahr an der Slate School of Fine Arts in London, schon seit vielen, vielen Jahren und auch Nadine Mirians Recherchen in der Resilienzwissenschaft und kenne auch ihre Leidenschaft für Kunst und, und Fotografie. Ähm, mit diesem Diskurs, Kunstdiskurs, heute möchte ich eine Verbindung schaffen zwischen Gideons aktueller Ausstellung, hier, die Sie hier sehen, um uns herum, und äh, unserer heutigen Gesellschaft. Eine Gesellschaft, die durch obsessive Selbstdarstellung, Selfie-Kultur in den sozialen Medien zum Hinschauen animiert, aber auch diese Selbstinszenierung äh, uns eigentlich von der richtigen Realität abwendet. Wir sind vor einer enormen Bilderflut, äh, die uns eigentlich keine Zeit mehr lässt, richtig hinzuschauen und richtig zu betrachten. Ähm, in dieser Ausstellung und herum äh, sehen wir Gideons Figuren, die dieses Mal sehr selbstsicher, provokant, äh, sportlich, mächtig hier zu uns schauen, aber dann auch wieder sehr melancholisch, zerbrechlich, nachdenklich wegschauen, looking away. Äh, Rückenfiguren, die uns ins Bild hineinziehen und uns anziehen und uns zum Nachdenken anregen. Diese, diesen Diskurs, den wir heute hier führen werden, soll kein wissenschaftlicher, theoretischer Kunstdiskurs sein, sondern mit Guillaume Rubin und Nadine Miriam möchten wir neue Ideen, neue Perspektiven vorschlagen, skizzieren, damit Sie so vielleicht dann danach die, die Ausstellung mit anderen Augen sehen. Die letzten zehn Minuten dieses Gesprächs sind dann Ihren Fragen gewidmet, also ich lade Sie herzlich ein, mit uns ihre Ideen zu teilen und ihre Gedanken skizzen zu unserer hinzuzufügen. Äh, ich möchte nur sagen, dass dieses Gespräch auf Englisch geführt wird.
to the art generally. And uh, yeah, and then he took me to London years later to stay. Uh, <coughs> a bit of twists and turns in between. And, mm. and that's when we met, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Nadi Miriam, um, I know that being a psychotherapist and lecturer was actually a, not one of your plans initially. Um, so it was actually more or less also an unexpected location. Uh, yeah, I think, is it easier? Okay. Uh, yeah, it was uh, definitely not my plan. I remember that I was always very critical with the school. I was not a huge fan of the school as a power institution in our world, and with around 12 or 13 years, I discovered at my parents' house this giant book of Bruno Ballet, a photographer of Iran. And just for the background, my parents came both from Iran, and I was never in Iran. So I had this huge interest in the country I had been to, and I knew that I am not going until the regime is not going to change. So I just look at these beautiful pictures, and I realized for myself that photography can change your point of view towards life. And uh, so I started doing research in photography. And you know, when I'm talking about research in those times, you went to the library, you were leasing books, like you, you were not in a smartphone generation. Um, and I found a manual photography for myself, like the development of manual photography. I discovered Henry Cartier Besson and James Nathaway's wall photographies. And when I started, um, when I started realizing that photography can touch me so much, I um, discovered also Sebastião Salgado's uh, series of Sahel in 1984 during the war. And uh, I saw these starving bodies of children and like dead bodies. It was a mess for me because I was really young, but I realized for myself that I want to deal with reality because it was something that we don't see in our world, especially like during my poverty. And through that I started um, dealing with like doing research and different discourses. The fun fact was that I was not very good at school, uh, but I was like reading Michel Foucault, <laughs> Blasius, like I was dealing with the whole history of psychiatry. And through that I realized that uh, the discourse psychiatry was the most inhuman system or had, no, was the biggest discourse that had a huge influence on inequality, like doing differences also on the art discourse, like scientific discourse and um, the science discourse and criminology. So after that I realized that I want to to work with reality, with life stories, and yeah, to deal with some kind of pain or like to do it better, maybe like, yeah, um, putting these two categories in a job. And I think I found it, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> um, you were actually mentioning this, these wonderful names, uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson, Salgado, uh, they're the photography, yeah, is, they're like testimonies of time, of real people, real emotions. Um, Gideon, photography uh, is an image, it's a very, very important part in your artistic practice. And of course, we're all living now in this digitalized uh, world, and you do as well. Um, internet is also a huge source of images and that you collect and you uh, select them first, you collect them and uh, you observe them and then afterwards you interpret your own imagination and some of these uh, pictures that we see here are situations actually that you have faced yourself, for example uh, the, the landscape over there um, the erotic uh, images of these naked women are childhood memories, uh, the 70s, 80s erotic magazines that you flick through, maybe hidden somewhere in a cupboard yeah. when you were a child. <laughs> research. <laughs> it was research at that time. And then, and then also some images that you were, uh, well, that you found uh, by surfing through the internet. 
And it's actually a certain kind of storytelling that you do, always this kind of urge of uh, telling new stories. Mm. And, uh, and when you go through this exhibition, I think you really feel this kind of particular, very personal way of storytelling, which somehow reminds me it has the same mood as Ellie Homer's movies. Which is that, which mm. that comes from, actually, mm. which that. Uh, so, really hot here, but uh, <laughs> so um, the. I mean, I, I just think when when I speak about photography, I just think of the, a moment when about 2005 I started into a shop, an old bookshop in Hampstead in London, not too far from where we live, and I found these 19th century or early 20th century old photographs, of books of Victorian images, mm -hmm. and these were kind of bleached photographs. Uh, because they were bleached with time, um, and they were beautiful, and they were poetic, and they were mysterious. And I think for years I was looking to work with photography, but I just couldn't find how to. So, so when the time I started painting in South America at the time, I needed to learn how to paint, how to work. I needed to learn this profession. I needed to know what paint does, what art does. And that's what was my concern. But uh, years uh, passed, and then I, kind of, I got myself to Europe. Mm -hmm. I visited to the Prado, a little experience in September 11 in New York that I was there in Um And I think my work changed. My work changed in this kind of, uh, it kind of followed my intrinsic self more. It became more, uh, uh, it became quicker, more immediate. And I think that, that was part of photography, because when I found those photographs, I found this kind of uh, an inkling. I just couldn't have enough of them. And before that, every time I started with a photograph, it just didn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So that was the initial start of the of photography. Um, and that led me to work with magazines, with newspapers. Um, I think initially it was always, it was always planted somewhere in history in the 50s and the 60s and the 30s and the 20s and going through decades and if we speak about this show it's um, it's just an involvement of how it went through those years and now it's just a mishmash of all these things put together so and that goes to the storytelling i find them as great inspiration i love for I, I love objects generally but i also love photographs um, and i find them as great point of departure, inspiration, that lead me to other things, mm -hmm. that I cannot know where they go, or, okay. yeah. Yeah, I mean, sometimes not even like, when you look at the picture, it's not uh, suddenly the picture that you see, it can be the person just at the back that inspires yeah. you, and then you start painting something, and something. And then the narrative opens up, yeah. and, and that narrative is totally departure from where it started mm -hmm. and it almost is almost quite sure who it was yeah. somehow. Yeah. Um, and yeah so, so if, if you look at the works, certain works like these, the images, the source of them is just found online images which I use as much as an old bookshop or a second hand shop or an antique market because mm -hmm. you just have everything. I'm, I'm a huge fan of old Polaroids and that's where I find them. Eric Homer is another. Mm -hmm. um, Stills, I don't take them as almost like I just pluck them out. I think there's the one that the landscape of, of the time, which you know, I kind of snap around with my phone and use that, kind of print it as then use it. Mm -hmm. So you've got the whole scope of flowers that were just in the studio and then I painted them from life, which I haven't done in a while. But now they kind of all sit together and occupy this, well, universe. Yeah, the space. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and now you're here, you once told me one of our conversations that you had that your work being a psychotherapist or psychotherapy is almost like storytelling. Um, yeah, well, it's very important to it's very important to know that, uh, like in all the jobs I do, it's very uh, it's the key to be very systemic, constructive. That means that as a lecturer, I'm I'm very non-judgmental in the way I'm teaching. As a therapist, of there is also, also another special protective room, room for my clients where we don't judge, like there is no hierarchy. There is no hierarchy in pain, there is no hierarchy in thought. I mean, there are some techniques, of course, you use as a therapist uh, to, to work with your clients, but at the end you can do whatever you want in this room. You can say whatever you want, and there's no right or wrong. And I think 
think this makes a whole new discourse for talking. And there is this book of Joseph Albers, Interactions of Colors, for example. There's one quote which I really like. Okay, I hope I can say it right now correctly, but it's about like if you tell if you have 50 people in a room and you say the color red, you have different, like 50 different reds in our minds. And I think this describes very well how I work and how I think at work, of course. Pilot is like something else, it's always not that easy to be that systemic constructive, but like at work it's the key. And um, also like in exercises in scene, this is also like the same, I told you already, the same for me. Like this, there's no right or wrong. As much as I look at your, as deeper I look at your paintings, I see something totally different. And it's like a giant space between my way of thinking and your way of thinking. And I think this is the beauty of uh, psychotherapy. And also, like my clients are storyteller, and I'm a story collector. And I think this is the it's, it's some kind of we integrate old stories in new life in a new life situation, or we delete them. Mm -hmm. There's so many techniques where we can work on stories and rebuild stories and renew stories. It's so, almost what's left. Yeah. Like footprints yeah. or like yeah. personal yeah. and, and I think there's really a, a parallel between what you say and your you want to see practice because there is no judgment. I mean, nobody's judging, as you said, like you're doing so many things, flowers, people, and there's no right or wrong, and you don't even know where you're going to go, maybe. You, you try to use it yeah. too, but it's, uh, you try to judge all the time, but you try not to. Yeah. You know, because you, you just because if you let the judging do the job, then nothing. Yeah, because you are dealing with your own emotion. The moment you're triggered, for example, I mean, everybody is triggered and someday, maybe many times a day, then you're not, um, in my opinion, you're not able to teach. And pay art is for me also, like, I'm also a huge art lover, as you know, and it, it's some kind of teaching or triggering me in a way, which, which is just like mine, it's my story. Like, you can, and Susan Sontag always, like, I love her work, she always wrote some kind of, that you're never allowed to touch a story. And I think this is like, what we do, and what we should do in therapy as a therapist. My, my first mentor, his name, his name was uh, Joseph Berg, he passed away many years ago, as an Australian painter, and lived in Israel for many years. Anyway, the story goes that he always used to be an amazing storyteller, his father was a Yiddish writer, Amazing story there. Yeah. And every time he used to tell me a story, I used to visit every time I went to Israel, he was still in the studio, he used to tell me a story, and I was like, Behemet, which means really? And he used to be insulted, he said, Why do you want to know if it's real? It's like a great story, isn't it? And so it's like, even is that, how he touched the story. Of course, and you can integrate it, same as your paintings. You can integrate them with yourself, and you can just see something if you just emphasize and see. And it's often the story that become reality, yeah. rather than what happened, obviously, which is debatable. Everything is like the key is systemic constructive, like constructivismus, you would say. It's there is no right or wrong. Everyone has their own reality. And I think this describes like my work, work jobs I do very well. Um, you were mentioning the exercise of seeing, and uh, this is actually giving you know, a very important preoccupation in this current uh, exhibition especially these two, this couple, that you are repeating over and over again. Um, nowadays we are actually exposed to this flood of images and actually we don't look anymore, we almost look through our phone before we even look with our eyes. And how is this exercise for you to be confronted with the same image and to paint it over and over again? How is this experience? I, I, this question is so, so multi-level. It's, it's you know, my, my head thinks of more around my head thinks of hundred million things. Level, but but that, so, so I'll just keep it focused, I'll just keep with these two. <laughs> um, so first of all, it's it's never planned. So the first two that started started like that. This is a, an ongoing series. This is the second stage of it. I've shown the first stage of it in San Francisco, which were same couple, different colored shirts and dress. That was a green dress and a red shirt. And they didn't get to this size, so there were four times duplicate, but up, not up to that size. And as I was doing the first series as well, there's a certain, there's a push and pull, there's a certain, obviously there's a need of, it, you're doing it, so you want to do it on some level, but there's also a quite a 
push because it says you know you've just done it. There's no reason to do it. And then you start fighting with yourself. And, 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 um, and then you kind of become involved. Then, then, so, so at every stage, so you, go, you go another one, and that convinces you, you're like, well, you know, that wasn't too bad. I didn't do myself that, I can do another one. It sounds actually quite painful when you go, but this is yeah, kind of like It's like, it's like, it's yeah. like uh, the studio, it's not like, um, mm. it, it, I think I, I use a lot of doubt, and it's always, it's never, it's never like, it's, it's just kind of trial and error, and every time the doubts come in, and it's, it's, it's interesting, even if the doubts, the, their volume grows, it's just a reason to go ahead and do it. Because obviously you're rejecting some reason and there's something to be discovered. So then you go and you go and you do that and then, so I've done that series and that worked out fairly well. Um, and then perhaps by chance, uh, I think maybe they, uh, I've, I've asked kind of the, my assistant to kind of do it in Photoshop to see how it looks in different color. Because they had some kind of a specificness and generalized way of looking at that image. It, it kind of, it was uh, timeless a little bit, placeless a little bit, it could remain places, it was just a general thing. Um, and I think by that it lets you know, so, so in the first, in the first uh, go I was really into the uh, backless dress of the woman, and that kind of led the way. And then when I started doing here with the blue dress, I, I was totally into the guy wore with his shirt, so that kind of pulled it. Um, and then I got to the four, and they were kind of the same, and I was like, oh, I can't do the same series, even though it's a different color. And then I had these two can makeup canvases, and I was like, oh, that's an awful idea. And then you go out the next day, and you have to do it. You have to try and do it, and you do it, and that's the way it is. So, in a sense, what, and the side open without that, it sharpens your sight. By that, I mean even myself as viewing them. I remember the guy from FedEx, who was some shipping, came into the studio and he was like, yo, you're doing the same painting, why are you doing the same painting? And I, and I was like, and, and I was like, if you sit and I, and I think he, he got it, like, and you look at it, you just see the differences more and more. The longer you sit with it, the more you see the differences, and then they become different people, I think. And I think, well, some days ago, we had this conversation between the three of us, and you were actually talking about twins, because people who have twins, they see this kids every day, and for them, they're so different. But as a foreigner, when you see these two, they look the same. And I think it's for you the same with these pictures. They don't look the same at all. You see the difference. Every every this, uh, every picture of the series is actually different. I think it frees you to look at the details. I think it mm. frees you to, to kind of wonder without mm. the, the kind of given narrative that you're trying to discover. Yeah. Because you've seen it already, so then you just float. Mm. And this, um, well, actually reminds me or let's go a little bit larger to society again because we have uh, well nowadays we live in this kind of uh, society uh, that is uh, actually quite uniform and then we also talk a little bit of individuality being unique etc and uh, but we have never been as uniform as we have been today actually so um, Dr. Nani Miriam how would you analyze that through these kind of pictures? First of all, it's I think just for the background very important that whenever I think about this uh, digitalization that I'm in, I always have this um, panopticon of Jeremy Bentham. I don't know, but well, I try to describe it. And like there was a philosopher in the 700s, mid or 700s, who built this prison, this architecture of prison, to show the social control we can have. So then you have to imagine there is a tower in the middle and there is a guardian who is like observing all the prison inmates. So um, the, the, the digitalization we are living in, which is like kind of underlining this not making differences because um, when you look deeper you can say that we have some kind of digital panopticon. There is this philosopher, Ion Chunan, who is also describing like the way we are living in our social media accounts is like People can look at my pictures and I don't know whenever they look at my pictures. So you get it kind of observed. And being different today is a, 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 like looking different into paintings, for example, also like Gideon. It's pretty hard because like the social structures, power structures are really pushing us in not looking deeper at art especially. I mean, 
we have to take the example of digitalization because we know that it changes a lot. And it changes also our eyes. Like when you go to a museum, everybody has their phones in their hands. It's kind of, kind of we talked about it in third eye. So because there are like two things that I see also like in Gideon's paintings. When you look deeper in Gideon's paintings, you have to, I don't want to say that people who use a lot of social media are not thinking, but you have to think. You have to integrate it. So when I look at your current exhibition, I look longer, I look twice, and I look on the next day, and I start thinking also about some things that happened in my own life. So this exercise and seeing is something that I think we totally lost through this kind of Sometimes like the, the opposite of, of, of uh, well, the quick TikTok, you know, kind of the quick, I mean, it's, 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 well, I don't blame me, but just generally it sounds like the opposite. Because we, we're being fed like quick five seconds, ten seconds, it just becomes shorter and shorter, the span becomes shorter. I see it for my girls, and I use it, but, but anyway, but you, you see that, so it becomes, yeah, like the opposite of, of what we need sometimes, and it's it's almost like now the need is greater to slow down. Maybe. Yeah, and I think that's also a question of time, and we're talking about that as well, the, um, one moment, these kind of exercises, you're also confronting a time for you as well, it's repeating over and over again, and it was maybe to spend more time with I, th I think this I think when you become a group, series? As, as, as a painter, it's, you quantify time by work. <laughs> it's it's like you say, oh, you know, I had like this two weeks past. No, it's like three paintings maybe. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, that, that, those two weeks were done by the work that I was <laughs> obsessing about or or um, I guess, but I remember um, uh, Gabriel who did this talk with me in the last show here in, in Cologne, and I remember he, he he kind of termed my work as, as trying sometimes to stop time, just mm -hmm. to slow it down, maybe not slow, slow it down or something. And I think I like that. I yeah. like that. And, um, and I think also going through the gallery invites us to slow down. And going through your uh, exhibition, I mean, invites us to slow down and to take time to really look and to get inside the picture. I, I mean, it's painting not, does that. And you see it when you come closer, you come far away. You look at how a painter does something. Mm -hmm. you, know, you look at them and then you look at the Velasquez. They just let you look at how they've done it. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you follow that. Yeah. And that takes time. Um, I wanted to talk about something that is, I think, very important for you, uh, for your exhibition, is uh, this Rücken figure that we see actually here all, all, over the, all over the exhibition in the space. I know your work now for many, many years, and I could say you're doing Rücken figures, so figures from the back for now more than 15 years, but this time, Obviously, got a real obsession to to do this Rücken figure. I think they just became more prominent for few reasons, probably more of the reasons. First, I find them again personal enough and general enough for me to be interested. They almost hold, uh, of course, they 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 they, um, they project or they activate a greater sense of space for me within the painting because they look outside the painting. Which we look with them. I find, um, yeah, I find the narrative quite strong because you are looking with a protagonist. You're looking with someone. So this is the center figure, but you're looking with it. That allows you to be quite open with the story. Um, I also find it quite. Uh, yeah, it's full of promise. This promise could be danger, this promise could be, you know, it could be positive, could be, that's not the point, but it's full of promise, and I like, I think, I, I find that. And then there's, um, it also allows you, I mean, you see it a lot in films, you know, when a great film just lies down, I think of In the Mood for Love, or uh, Walk and Wise, you know, there's a certain shot or something, or, 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 and, and there's just a need of something, just a, a part of, a, of, of an ankle, a part of a dress, a, a cap, a cap. That little thing um, compensates everything mm -hmm. within it. Mm -hmm. And it, it always gives me a uh, shivers a little bit. And, and maybe I'm stuck with that. Um, it's true that you leave actually with, with this kind of neutral background, always the story very neutral. You leave it to the spectator actually to project his 
very own ideas and memories, I guess. And yeah, so it's actually almost like a like a white page that you leave to to your spectators. Almost. I was almost bewildered when I think of that. I think of the big uh, full figure Picard Delo, sorry, Velasquez portrait in the Prado, and they hold this kind of theatrical space which is real mm -hmm. and at the same time it's not real at all mm -hmm. and it's like theater and it's timeless and it's as um, activated and real for me looking at it at that moment mm -hmm. and obviously it was for Velasquez to make it and you know generations ago and I've always been captivated by that always been captivated and probably it's partly because I'm so jealous of the theater the set designers and stuff mm -hmm. and that was always a sort of a dream to make a stage Never got the chance to be happy with my own stuff. Certainly. Um, Dr. Nadia Miriam, how would you see this Olympic figure interpret the postures? I mean, my, my first uh, impress was that I was thinking about the opportunities, the opportunities we have in our modern societies by looking back or looking away and uh, you see some hopes, some promise, as you already said, so you can see many things, but I was, because maybe of my scientific background at the moment, I'm dealing a lot with pain, this, this book idea of mine, so maybe I was just thinking about today's society and trying to detaboo topics, by really not detabooing maybe a lot, because like you throw through your, let's take social media, you see a lot of people being very transparent with their emotions, which is really good, because I think it's very important to talk about pain, to cry in front of people. I mean, this is like a lot of strength behind. But I see also the danger, because you can also swipe right. And so this was the first impression I had with the Gideon's uh, paintings, uh, especially that like wooden figure. Mm -hmm. um, you were mentioning taboo and uh, detabooing, actually. And uh, um, it's true, uh, when you see, when you go through this exhibition, you what I feel is you feel this kind of uh, obvious contrast on the one hand and you feel this kind of discretion and abstraction when it comes to emotions, for example with the figure, and then uh, on the other hand there's this kind of very extroverted and detailed images of nudity, sexuality, of, of power, of leisure, you know, you see these people playing golf and golf is always associated to powerful people, rich people, um, politicians, billionaires signing their deals at the golf club. So um, there is this tension between taboo, vulnerability and, and power. I, I, I think of, of more, I think what you're saying about golf and uh, playing golf or that, and, and it's very true, and what I'm thinking, I'm kind of thinking, where did I get those images probably from them? Advertising to Life magazine in the 70s, promising that, you know, and and I'm interested in that promise. I'm like, um, maybe that's just being older than that, of, of, you know, just of kind of like, where's that black and white world that they promised, you know, it's like uh, this or that, good or bad, it's easy then, you know, so that's, I, I, but. Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's more about that promise of something like that, mm -hmm. not necessarily mm -hmm. um, the promise and the distance from yeah. it somehow. Um, it also this, this this figure from the back also kind of brings me up to, to the to, to just looking away, mm -hmm. which is the sort of again coming back to what we were talking about in terms of of this imagery and, and this is this is me and, and this is my life. Um, and on the other hand, I mean, another thing that because we, we kind of spoke about this talk and I had to think about the last show I had here, and it was way heavier in terms of subject. Mm. It was called Warning Shadows. But you know, the shadows are here already. Um, not to say that it was perfect and nothing was, you know, or everything is bad now. But somehow this looking away, again, this is just, I'm, I guess I'm born with it, as we spoke in the last couple of days, is it comes like this almost as an active thing. You know, turning, so historically we know looking away is not, it's not, it's not a solution at all. 
Uh, but now when we're all in this kind of bonfire of, of vanity, you know, of like of, of public square looking away, and I'm not saying I'm looking away, I'm just pointing at the germ, it becomes like an active thing, like actually an active thing. Oh no, I don't want to play. Maybe it's also as a side effect, it's when I'm very young, something healthy to look away, you know, in this current society. Yeah, so, so for me, repetition is inseparable to um, artistic creativity. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think that was a beautiful end of our conversation. And um, I would like now to invite you, Kivlade, Sie herzlich ein, nun Ihre Fragen zu stellen an Guido Mobin und Dr. Nadimiria. Was sind Ihre Gedanken, Ihre Gedankenskizzen? I did not. I'm not for you. <laughs> but you can definitely come and ask me anything later as well. I'd be happy to say. Well, so. 
Thank you very much.